Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for this invitation to this very prestigious seminar series. And thank you, Philip, for uh, helping me out with advice. Um, I'm uh, speaking to you uh, today from my Basel flat. Uh, and I hope the Wi-Fi uh, uh, keeps, keeps working because I get the Wi-Fi through the windows and through this window here and the buildings you see outside the windows are other university institutes. And so I get Edurom through there, through the windows. And if I, if I move too much, the walls are very thick in this building. And if I move too much, it, I wouldn't get it. So let's hope this is not going to be the talk that goes wrong. Uh, this uh, flat that I'm in is a building uh, dating back officially to 1394. Uh, Erasmus lived here from 1522 to 1529, and he died in Basel. Uh, the guided tours come by, and uh, the guide stands outside the building and points up and mentions Erasmus, the wise man. Uh, and once I opened the windows and shouted very loudly, uh, is my dinner ready, Mrs. Erasmus? Uh, more relevant, uh, the, the building was owned by the Bernoulli family from 1685 for 100 years. And in particular, Johann Bernoulli I uh, used to give, it's known that he used to give oil a weekly lessons. And uh, in those days, there weren't any institutes and there weren't any offices. And so it's almost, it's fairly likely that the lessons took place in the building I'm speaking from. Uh, Basel is very proud of the Bernoullis. Uh, there are at least eight or nine altogether that were mathematicians and, and uh, Daniel Bernoulli lives up the, up, the, up the road from me, but he's not a mathematician, he's a geologist. Uh, they weren't so proud of Euler because uh, after he, well, he didn't get a chair here and then he left and he never came back to Basel. I think never came back to Switzerland. So let's start now. This is let's so this here here pencils of norm form equations and a conjecture of Thomas joint work with Francesco Amoroso and Umberto Zanier. Uh, all about Diophantine equations, and we already heard a lot about this. Uh, uh, let me just get that out of the way. Yes, uh, we still don't know. We heard a nice talk early on. Uh, we still don't know if there are integers x, y, z with x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed equals 114. Uh, we know that uh, x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed is equals three has at least 10 solutions, x, y, z, integer triples. And we also heard some heuristics for the existence of infinitely many, but uh, it seems no one be, nobody has any conjectures about any possible structure. Uh, I think it's believed uh, that uh, somehow they grow exponentially, but uh, more than that, I don't, I'm not aware of. Uh, Swinnerton Dyer used to, he once wrote that a particular problem has only not been solved because no one has seen how to apply modular forms to it. Um, so uh, this he was, I think he wrote this before Fermat, and uh, he was certainly right about Fermat. So uh, uh, possibly uh, that might be an approach to this very difficult problem. Uh, this one is not a norm form equation. Now, I hope this works. Yeah. But uh, this one is x cubed plus 2y cubed plus 4z cubed minus 6xyz equals 165. And the left hand side factorizes over the field obtained from the rationals by adjoining the cube root of two. Uh, another example is this quartic ternary, x to the fourth minus two y to the fourth minus eight y to the fourth minus eight y z times x squared minus y z equals one. And there you, there you have uh, the fourth root of two. <clears throat> now the first equation actually has infinitely many solutions in integer triples, and they have a very nice multiplicative structure. It comes from units. Uh, but the second is different. It has 
at most finitely many solutions. Uh, you see a couple of solutions by putting uh, y equals z equals zero and x equals plus or minus one. The, the finiteness of the number of solutions lies pretty deep. It's the Schmidt subspace theorem. We did have a talk about that as well. Uh, and uh, this is uh, incidentally not effective. So uh, it may be rather difficult to find them all in the current state of knowledge. So later on, we'll see more details about uh, what I'm talking about here. So the individual study of individual equations is uh, sometimes easier and sometimes harder. And uh, what we're interested in here is pencils of uh, Diophanton equations, a fancy word for one dimensional families and I uh, use a, a parameter T and this parameter T is also taken to be an integer. Now, if you take a general kind of family, it's not possible to say much. And uh, uh, the first non-trivial Diophantin equation in two variables is probably the Pell equation, x squared minus t y squared equals one. So here comes the uh, here comes the parameter. And for each fixed t positive, which is not a square, uh, there's an infinite set of solutions, and it has a very nice multiplicative structure. But if you start varying t, then there may be no no, no simple description of, of what the solutions look like. <clears throat> but uh, if I fiddle around and replace the parameter t by uh, t squared minus one, then uh, it is possible to solve this equation uh, for act actually for all t. The solutions are given by uh, this formula, x plus y square root of t minus t squared minus one is plus or minus t plus square root t squared minus one to the power plus or minus n. And that's uh, for all n zero, one, two. And uh, that's an infinite set if uh, t is uh, uh, bigger than two in absolute value, at least two in absolute value. So uh, this, can be, this can be written, we can get rid of the square root here and write it in a rational way in the following sense. Uh, x, uh, hey, oh, what's happened here? Ah, panic. Oh, panic. No, I, I, I'm panic. It's a shopping list. It's a shopping list. That's all it is. Uh, uh, they say that J.K. Rowling, uh, who wrote the Harry Potter books, could make a bestseller out of her shopping lists. Uh, but this is not very exciting. It's sort of slightly embarrassing. Scones, jam, cream, and Earl Grey tea. Uh, and the fish. Uh, oh dear, this is embarrassing. Uh, how can we get rid of this? Uh, fish, this reminds me of uh, Michael McQuilland who used to uh, punctuate his lectures with slides of fish dinners. Oh, sorry about this. Let's, let's, go, on. let's, let's go on to the next page. Ah, oh, so I made a double mistake here. I've got that page twice and now the thing is gone. So where were now? Ah, oh, now how do I how do I go back? Ah, oh, ah, oh, now it works. So I have to just recap. Uh, this these integer solutions here were the solutions of the the modified Pell equation, <clears throat> and uh, x and y then become after get ri getting rid of the square root x and y become polynomials in uh, T with integer coefficients. Um, I think the first, I won't write any down. Uh, uh, one here is one and zero, and another one is uh, T and one. Now, uh, so things are interesting, uh, even on the Pell level. Uh, if you go further to higher degree, then you're no longer Pell. You have a 2A equation, and uh, if I take simply replace two by three, I get this equation. And then uh, one can say a similar thing. Uh, for every t not equal to one, the only solutions in integers are one zero and t one. So the same as, as, as one has for this modified pill. This is a deep result of uh, Bennett, known as Mike to his friends, who proved much more, including the higher degree things. and. Uh, actually an even more general result where you have a coefficient a here and a coefficient b here. <clears throat>
Uh, the proof uses hypergeometric identities and linear forms and logarithms and some uh, very sophisticated estimates for divisibility. So uh, our theme today was started by Emery Thomas, uh, who was an American mathematician, rather an original mathematician. He, he, he found some nice results on two A equations with few coefficients. Uh, before that, in 1990, he considered this equation. So this is, a, a, again, a two A equation, a cubic form here. And you have a parameter here, T, sitting in a nice linear way, as opposed to any cubic way here. So uh, this is uh, quite an elderly equation. And he showed that this equation has only the solutions, uh, there's the well-known one and zero, and then this and this solution, provided T is sufficiently large, so 13 million or so. <clears throat> uh, probably this has been improved a lot. Uh, the solving two A equations has been a very, <clears throat> been developed to a high degree of sophistication recently. But this was the first result of its kind, I think. He used linear forms in logarithms. Uh, linear forms in logarithms tend to throw out very big numbers, but uh, not if you use the rather fine versions due to Mignot and Balschmidt and others. So a bit later, 1993, Thomas proposed a general concept of stably solvable. We write our equation out as a polynomial x, y, and t. So uh, as in this one here, uh, then we can ask all to, to solve the corresponding equation when you put big letters in, big X, big Y, and big T, where big T is now a variable corresponding to little t, and you're trying to solve this in X, Y as polynomials. So you've gone kind of polynomial, or uh, let's call these functional solutions. And then uh, why would you like to do this? If you can do that, then by specializing T 2t, big t to little t, then we get integer solutions here. So uh, sometimes you can get the integer solutions from the uh, functional solutions. But not always, already the Pell equation has no functional solutions, so uh, this doesn't work always. And then Thomas uh, proposed a general kind of uh, idea that uh, all integer solutions in vague terms, this is just a vague uh, formulation, all integer solutions, little x, little y, come from specializing functional solutions, big x, big y, at least if t is sufficiently large. Uh, you must expect that t can be, must be taken large to avoid uh, special cases for small t. Uh, this does hold for this modified Pell equation, as we said, and also the higher degree analogs, cubic and so forth. Uh, he gave a nice example where some functional solutions are easy to see. Uh, and this is a kind of a typical example. You take D polynomials over Z, and uh, you write down this two A equation. Here it factorizes nicely, but then you add Y to the D and then the factorization is gone. So uh, you have this equation. Uh, ah, then you have, for there the functional equations, X, Y is one zero, which is an old friend now, and A one big T one, A D big T one. So if you put uh, y, y equals one and x equals a one, for example, then this, this is zero and then you get y equals one here, one here. <clears throat> so he considered this kind of family and he conjectured two things. So uh, first of all, this general principle star, uh, local to global, you can think of it as, this holds if the degrees of these polynomials are different. And then he also conjectured uh, part B that these above these functional solutions are the only functional solutions. And uh, <clears throat> he, 
he had a lot of partial results on A. Uh, but soon afterwards, B was disproved by Ziegler, uh, with even with D equals three and these values, these polynomials, these three polynomials. So uh, B uh, is more problematic. So since then, there was a lot of work. Uh, and I don't give a detailed history. I wrote down uh, the names. I'm sorry if I've missed out some names. Uh, Sometimes the names have initials uh, for certain reasons. Uh, there's more names than this on the next sheet. Duyella, A, Halter Koch, Heuberger, Lee, E.J., Lemmermeyer, Lettl. Uh, here is, a, now I have a request. Um, uh, this E.J. Lee was the last research student of Alan Baker. And uh, she's mentioned in the literature. Uh, but I can't, she has no internet presence and uh, Cam Stewart and uh, Rob Tiderman uh, draw, drew my attention to this, to this woman. Uh, and if anybody knows the full name, I would be uh, grateful to, to know this full name. So, uh, Levesque, Mignot, Peter, Roth R, so this is not the Roth, but a Roth, Tichy, uh, I can't, I don't know how to pronounce this name, Tsanakis, Vutje, Wakabayashi, and Balschmidt. <clears throat> so uh, what's new here? Um, uh, a, a, a general method. Um, instead of stating any general theorems, which, which get rather technical, uh, I'm going, going to stick in this talk to um, some examples which may or may not be interesting. So for example, we, we were able to prove this star thing, this local to global uh, for uh, this equation when D equals three uh, and not just for the degrees of the A's different, but uh, the polynomials themselves are different. Uh, it probably holds for all polynomials, but we didn't go quite that far. So the Ziegler counterexample is no longer interesting because uh, this star says nothing about the functional solutions. Uh, the method extends to this, uh, this uh, 2A equation, but it doesn't give uh, T, all T not equal to one, just T sufficiently large. It also extends to certain uh, non, non, uh, non-inhomogeneous equations, uh, which don't seem to have been in the subject before. Uh, so we look at this, x cubed minus t cubed minus one y cubed plus three t cubed minus one x y plus t cubed minus one squared equals one. So this was before, and we've added this, and this, and this makes it then uh, non-homogeneous. So uh, you can't transform this into a 2A equation with linear transformations. So this is uh, slightly different. And uh, now the finiteness for each t, at least not equal to zero or one, is guaranteed by Siegel's theorem on uh, curves of genus one. And that's effective because of Baker and Coates in 1970. <clears throat> for this equation, we, term, we determine all the functional solutions and also uh, the arithmetic consequence and the upshot is that for t at least t is sufficiently large the only interest solutions are given by this t squared 2t and t squared minus t <clears throat> further we're not restricted to two variables as earlier work was uh, here is an example of a of a quartic ternary quartic so it's a little bit like the other one i had before a little bit like this one here, but we got the parameter in it. So here, there turn out to be infinitely many functional solutions, which uh, I don't think was envisaged, envisaged by <coughs> Thomas. Uh, Thomas, in his conjecture, writes down a finite list. Uh, here, there's infinitely many functional solutions, but still, 
Uh, the local to global holds, and the upshot is now that for T sufficiently large, all inter solutions are given by x, y, z equals plus or minus x n t squared zero plus or minus y n t squared, the varying n. And these are the x n and y n that come from the Pell equation, which I <coughs> wrote down, but not explicitly. And then uh, the uh, sporadic solutions, you have 12 sporadic solutions uh, in the sense that, uh, well, there are just 12 of them. Um, this is one of this is the this is the, the most complicated one. Four t to the six minus four five t squared four t minus four t. So these hold identically in, in t, and so they come from the function equation, the functional solutions. Uh, in all the results, this t zero that comes up is effective. So, <clears throat> but we. For no single equation did we calculate it uh, explicitly. So what is this method about? Uh, let's uh, go through uh, how it works using this, uh, uh, this uh, 2A, 2A non-form <coughs> with the extra thing here. Now it has an aspect of the 2A equation in that the left-hand side does factorize x minus sy plus s squared x minus omega sy plus omega squared s squared and x minus omega squared sy plus omega s squared where s is the cube root of t cubed minus one uh, we can expect uh, this s to come up from this part here so that's the factorization of this left hand side um, omega is uh, the cube root of one e to the two pi i over three I recently had to uh, look again at some papers of uh, Siegel and um, and uh, During on the class number problem, and I came across uh, Siegel's notation, which greatly improves this notation: one to the one over three. So one is, of course, e to the two pi i. So this makes perfect sense. I don't know why this uh, this notation didn't uh, didn't catch on, uh, but it seems to have been forgotten. Okay, so how can we go forward here? We have the factorization here, and that's equal to one. And therefore, if you have a solution, then all of these things are units. And uh, let's, it's enough to take the first one. That's a unit in the field uh, generated by S. Now, S is the cube root of T cubed minus one, and it is, rather easy to see that if t is sufficiently large, then q of s is a real cubic field and it has an identifiable unit, namely t minus s. You just verify that. And this is the uh, crucial point of the whole method that you have to be able to see the units and you have to be able to see the units in a functional sense as well. Uh, here we're still in the arithmetic, t, t, is, a, t is an integer. Uh, the unit has norm one, and therefore this x minus sy plus s squared is some power of this with no sign there. t minus s to the power m, where m is an integer. So there's not a lot uh, new so far. This all looks very familiar, I think, to experts. Uh, what does what do people do now? They eliminate X and Y from these. Oh, well, sorry, I forgot to say that. Now we now take conjugates. Uh, S is this cubic, cube root of something. And so putting the omegas in give you uh, two more equations, omega, omega squared, and then omega in here, omega squared, omega, and omega squared in there. So we now have three equations in two unknowns, S and Y. M is of course an unknown. And now we eliminate X and Y through Siegel's identity. This, this is not the last appearance of the name Siegel. Uh, this is known as name dropping. Uh, and uh, if you do this elimination, it's rather simple. And you get uh, the T minus S to the M. That's this one plus T minus Omega S to the M here plus multiplied by Omega plus Omega squared T minus Omega squared S to the power M is three S squared. And the three S squared comes from this stuff here. 
So uh, this is an S-unit equation, uh, but it's got four terms. Uh, that's an S-unit. These are S-units, the M's. It just doesn't involve M, but uh, if you want to make it an S-unit equation, you have to give it, allow it four terms. The subspace theorem applies for each fixed T, but as I said, this is ineffective. So it's uh, useless in our context where you want to keep track of the T. How am I, go how am I going? Where's the... I'm going far too fast. What to do? Play for time. <laughs> uh, so there's the equation. So we now write this in a more general form. Um, incidentally, on the, on, if on the, on for the usual two equation, you wouldn't have these terms here. So you wouldn't have this term and it would be an S unit equation with three terms. And there are many, many ways of handling that effectively. Here, this, this here is the joker. So what do we do? Well, we immediately make it more complicated. We write it out as uh, in uh, sort of geometrical language, um, which is not too critical to think geometrically, but seems natural here. We write it out as a, as a K term equation with K equals four. P is now a point TS on a curve C defined by this equation corresponding to the equation connecting little s and little t. And uh, the alphas are the coefficients in here. So the alphas are one omega, omega squared, and this one. And the f's are fixed functions on the function field of this curve um, over q bar, because we've got omega floating around everywhere. And Q bar of, of S is just, of course, Q bar adjoined big S and big T. So F1 ST is T minus S here. That's this one. Uh, alpha 1 is 1, and that's this coefficient. <clears throat> now we uh, apply one of the main results of our paper with. Uh, Amoroso and Zanier, bounded height in pencils of finitely generated subgroups. That's Duke uh, 2017. And this gives you an estimate for the height of P in terms of the various objects here. And uh, it gives the following estimate that the height of P is at most K times the height of the coefficient vector divided by M plus H zero. Uh, I'll go to the next slide uh, pretty soon. This M here is in the denominator, which is important. And one can imagine that uh, this should be true. These are logarithmic heights. I'm not going to define heights too much in detail. These are logarithmic, although I could to make up, for, I could to, to spin out the time. Uh, these are logarithmic heights, the height of, and then so this M here, if you take it over here, you get M, uh, height of p, which is height of p to the m, and this corresponds to the exponential there. So you may expect a denominator of m here if things go well. And this you do have. <clears throat> there are some conditions here, no vanishing subsums. That's, um, that's a kind of universal condition, a knee-jerk condition, this has to be there. And m is sufficiently large. Uh, M at least M0 and uh, M0 is effective and this H0 is also effective and they depend only on C and the F's. Uh, and so for our original equation here, they would be absolute constants. <clears throat> uh, so we have to say some, a little bit about the heights because we've got uh, the two of them here. Uh, what's the height of P here? So you see P is T, of a, T and S. The height of T is uh, by itself log T. Uh, T is a positive integer. So the height, the height in here will be log T asymptotically or exactly. And the S here is, uh, that was the analog of this equation, S 
little s cubed equals little t cubed minus one. So the height of s is again about log t. And if you bunch them together, you get, uh, depending on how you do it, you get uh, log t or two log t. Two log t would be the uh, crude bound. So the HP is asymptotically two log t. Uh, the H uh, alpha one up to alpha k is, is as you see here, the, the coefficients, that's constant, that's constant. They're even roots of unity. So the heights of these coefficients are zero. But here you have this thing, and so this is going to give you another two log h, log t. So the height of the coefficients is asymptotically two log t. So here you have two log t, here you have up here two log t. And uh, if m is then bigger than k, which is four, if m is bigger than four, then uh, you have more log t's on the left hand side than you have on the right hand side. So you can take the right hand side over and you get a bound for t. The bound for t then depends on h0, but that was effective. So as soon as m is bigger than 4 and m is bigger than m0, we get t bounded. And uh, that, is, that is the basic strategy of the proof. Um, there are these uh, snags here, uh, no vanishing subsums. Uh, they can be handled by induction on K. Uh, they don't uh, turn up in, in this particular four term equation. Uh, but here is another snag, uh, M bigger than four and M bigger than M zero. So the small M's have to be handled. And indeed, something has to be done because we haven't seen anything about the functional equations yet, the functional solutions. Uh, we just appeared to get no solutions. Now, what to do about small m, or let's say a fixed m. So if, you, if m is fixed, then this equation, or even go back to this equation is simpler. If m is fixed here, this is a fixed equation for t. Uh, S is an algebraic function of t. So you're going to get a fixed equation for t here. And so you can just uh, solve it for t. And that's going to give you another upper bound for t. Uh, but there's a problem here, a slight problem here, that the equation could end up as 0 equals 0. So the equation for t uh, just disappears. Uh, and then you're back, then you're home, because if it's zero equals zero, then the equation holds for all little t, in other words, identically in big T, and you've ended up with a functional solution. And you don't have to even find what it is if you just want this local to global situation. Oh, I was, here I, here I made a mistake. Here there's two pluses. Uh, this reminds me of uh, Sayer wrote to once that uh, if he sees a mistake on the blackboard, he, he, he experiences physical discomfort. So I'm sorry if any of you experience phys physical discomfort with this term here. So how does one prove this, this seven? Let's go back into that. Uh, still far too much time left. <clears throat> how to prove this height boundedness result. Uh, there are some uh, height boundedness results already in the literature um, whose point is to prove that, that in, merely that the height is bounded from above. Uh, we want a bit more than that. We want a specific bound here and we want this, really want this M here. This is, this is crucial. So it's a kind of uh, very sharp height up and bound estimate. So I'm going to take an example. I'm going to simplify this and take an example which is much uh, simpler than this uh, two equation. Still a four term one and still uh, three powers, three things raised to the power m. But instead of t and s, just a tau, a one minus tau, and a one plus tau. And that is equal to one. And now, m is any integer, positive or negative. 
tau is not allowed to be 0, 1, or minus 1. Otherwise, these won't make sense. But it's allowed to be any algebraic number. And we want to get an upper bound for the height of tau, uh, which is an absolute constant. So uh, why should it be bounded the height of tau? If you rub out that term and rub out that term, then you just get tau to the m equals 1. So tau is a root of unity. That's in the set 1 to the power q in the Seagulls notation. Uh, when tau is a root of unity, then the height is 0, and you've got uh, uh, the best possible upper bound. Uh, <clears throat> if you rub out this one and this one, then it's a bit different. You get that 1 minus tau is a root of unity. So tau is a root of unity minus one. And the height of that is not zero, but is at most log two. So uh, that's, that's almost convincing that the height should be bounded. But uh, it's non-trivial. It's non-trivial even if you uh, rub out this term here. If you rub out only this term, then you've got uh, tau to the m plus one minus tau to the m is one. And it was shown by uh, Berkers in 1997 uh, that the height of tau is at most six. Uh, again, using uh, hypergeometric functions. Uh, we don't know if these can be used here. Uh, probably they can't be. Probably there are no uh, Pade approximations, appropriate Pade approximations. Um, so, but it's possible, uh, we don't know how to do it. And so we use another approach, uh, which goes back to uh, what Tuwe was doing after he uh, failed to, to use hypergeometric functions in a different context. Uh, we use Siegel's lemma now uh, to construct polynomials A, B, C, D over Z with uh, a certain identity, ax, x to the m plus bx, 1 minus x to the m plus cx, 1 plus x plus x to the m equals dx. This x should really be capital T, it's, uh, but I, I switched into the, uh, automatically into the x notation. Uh, so you can start polynomials like this with Siegel lemma, and their degrees are not too big. I won't say exactly what they are, but it's such that uh, uh, these exist and they, their coefficients aren't too big. If you substitute x equals tau in here, then uh, you get another relation between these three quantities, but now with some coefficients in there. Uh, that's not enough. So you differentiate this thing once. And when you differentiate, the x to the m more or less stays x to the m. And you get a, a third uh, uh, relation between these three quantities, also with coefficients. So you've got three relations between these three quantities. And you can hope to solve for tau to the m. So there we are, three relations between these three quantities. And if you do solve this, then uh, you get an upper bound for the height of tau to the m, which is, uh, as I've indicated before, absolute value of m times the height of t, height of tau. And uh, the bound will involve the coefficients of a, b, and c, and these are also exponential in m by the construction, and uh, that means you get a a bound for h of tau. It doesn't involve the denominator m anymore because I've changed the context slightly. Uh, there are various snags on the way. Uh, you have to actually differentiate um, uh, a number of times, which is a small proportion, a small uh, multiple of m. And then you have to check that you can do the elimination. Uh, all these snags were, were uh, removed by 2a. Uh, and 2a is uh, strongly associated with ineffectivity, but uh, just to show that this is 
this is this is effective and can be made by excellent a master student of mine Adrian Dentz who very shrewdly left mathematics to go into infectious diseases uh, and I think he's flourishing there now he calculated that the in this uh, this three term situation here the height of tau is less than 600. Uh, another nice result that he had um, was if you if you eliminate this thing but replace this exponent m by a different one n then the method still works tau to the m plus one minus tau to the n equals one and uh, in that case the height of tau is at most 1300 i didn't write this down uh, provided m and n are not both one because then this would be a functional solution <clears throat> so finally how does one find the functional solutions if one wants to uh, for our example uh, for our uh, cubic non-form, we end up with the functional equation, the functional version of five. So that would be the functional version of this, which is just big T and big S here with big T a variable and big S the cube root of big T cubed minus one. So you've got this equation and now you're in ABC country. Uh, ABC territory or ABCD here. And this is all well known to be effective. And you can use various results in the literature, but uh, in practice, it's these involve rather complicated uh, definitions of heights and considerations of genus and Hurwitz. And uh, one can just throw maple at it. Um, you can argue that these functions, the, the corresponding functional versions of uh, the things I had before, the three, fun the three things occurring in five here are these three these four functions are linearly dependent over c so uh the Ronskin is zero start differentiating with with respect to big t and the Ronskin is zero there will be a huge power in this Ronskian. Uh, the whole business complication of ABC, ABCD stuff is that the if what happens if the Ronskin is zero? But if you take an example, uh, then the Ronskin won't be zero. Very unlikely. And you remove these large powers and you get a very simple equation which leads immediately to M equals minus one, zero, one or two. <clears throat> uh, there's a curious, so, ah, oh, time is, I'm, making respectable pace here. There's a curious side issue here. Um, our results solve the equations uh, in a uniform way for t sufficiently large, which is effective. And uh, what about t small? The methods don't work. And uh, we see no way of using, of, uh, of solving these quartic ternaries or small values of t because uh, one has to uh, one has to use the subspace theorem. So this is a, a a curious, outstanding problem. Uh so let me see the time. Yes. Uh, here is a here is what I call the Baker Quintic from 1967, which is a, a lovely result. I remember first coming across this. It's a ternary quintic of the same kind of shape and uh, t is sufficiently large so this is rather the, the, the thomas thomas uh, thomas thomasy this if t is large and you have this equation here this is a form now equal to n then uh, the solutions x y and z are all at most t to the power 2500 times n squared <clears throat> And uh, you have this polynomial dependence on T, and uh, this may suggest that the Thomas, uh, the Thomas uh, uh, philosophy or uh, strategy or conjecture applies to this, at least if you um, 
take n equals one. Uh, and again, small t makes somewhat uh, the same the same trouble. Uh, the dependence on n is uh, extremely good. This is done by Padet approximation. Uh, this I think I'll skip. Um, oh, here's here's my fish dinner. Now I'm now I'm making up time. Here is my fish dinner. Uh, here are some oysters. They've they've gone, or the remains of oysters. This is uh, this is a fish called John Dory. These are potatoes, and this is spinach, and this is uh, this is the accompaniment. Uh, what I did on my holidays. Uh, here is Bulbaki. One of these gentlemen is uh, is General uh, called Denis Bulbaki, a, a French general, and he was in command of a French army which was under attack by uh, under attack by a German army near the Swiss border, and he uh, knocked on the door, and the Swiss let him in, and. Uh, there is a huge panorama of the whole thing. The battlefield is, is to the left, is to the right here. Well, there's, there was no battle. Uh, that's where they were quartered. This is uh, now, this is Switzerland, uh, Les Verrières. And uh, there's a huge field there where they were kept. And there's a magnificent panorama painting, which you can see in Lucerne. Uh, I took this photograph last July, uh, where I was passing through Les Verrières. The site is, is rather impressive. Um, the connection with the mathematical Bulbaki is extremely tenuous and uh, not really known. It was suggested that some French mathematical student uh, heard that this seminar was running in London, in, uh, in Paris and uh, thought it a bit crazy and said, oh, this guy Bulbaki was crazy. Why not call it that? And uh, this, this uh, this somehow caught on. It seems to be nothing more than some student suggestion. Uh, he was a slightly um, forlorn figure, uh, Bourbaki. Uh, after this debacle here, he tried to shoot himself, but the bullet flattened against his head, apparently. Uh, so he came out well in the end. Uh, oh, I still have time. This is what I did. Also, I, I visited the uh, gravestone of Riemann. Uh, I can't magnify this. This is in Latin anyway. This is uh, in Italy, overlooking Lag Lago Maggiore. And uh, he died here at the age of uh, 39 of uh, tuberculosis. Uh, his his actual grave is not there. His actual grave was somewhere near, but uh, it seems to have been destroyed. They moved, they moved the cemetery and uh, what became the original site is no longer known and what became of the actual grave is also not known. Uh, it was not so easy to find. I found myself uh, cycling down this weird lane, not knowing if I would find what I wanted or not. Uh, this is what I had prepared in case something went wrong. Uh, this is hopeless, the server keeps going down. But of course, if something went wrong, I wouldn't be able to show this. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's practically all I have to say. I, I mentioned two of the organizers by name. So uh, maybe I should uh, mention the third organizer by name. This I saw carved. Uh, at the top of a castle. This is uh, a couple of miles from Basel. This is, I was out during the lockdown when I shouldn't have been. Uh, quite a sunny day there. And I saw this carved on one of the, the, the beams there. Uh, and uh, here is the castle. And here is the flag, the Swiss flag or the Basel flag. Uh, okay, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>